pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, all praise, honor, and glory is yours. And today, Father, we come before you and with gratitude in our hearts, we just say thank you. Thank you for the breath in our lungs. Thank you for the blood in our veins. Thank you for the fire in our soul. Lord God, thank you for the gift of life. And Lord God, even on the days when it is hard, you are still powerful. You are still present. You are with us. And you never leave us nor forsake us. And Father, today, whether we are in the midst of a wonderful season of blessing or a painful season of doubt, I pray we would be reminded that in our praise and adoration of you, Father, you make yourself known. That you walk with us. And when we cannot walk, God, you carry us. For you are our God and we are your people. And you love us. And you never abandon us. No matter how many times, God, we walk away from you, you never quit on us. No matter how difficult the road ahead of us, we don't have to walk it alone. We walk with you. So, Father, we thank you. We thank you for today. We thank you for this time. And I pray, Lord God, that our hearts and our minds would be in the place to listen to your word. But not just to hear it with our ears, but God, to hear it and apply it to our lives. That we would be men and women of faith. And that as you speak, we would be faithful to listen and to follow and that we would have a peace and a confidence to know where you are leading us, you already are waiting for us. So today, Lord God, speak, for we are ready. We love you, we praise you, and we thank you. And we pray all of this in the powerful and mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning. good morning. It is great to see all of you guys here today. My name is Pastor Paul, and I'm the lead pastor here at Crosspoint. It is an honor and a privilege to be here with you today and to share God's Word with you. And I'm excited about what God has to say to us today. And as we're going to dive into a powerful story, we're going to talk about somebody and, and the position that they found themselves in, and it's going to be really, really awesome. And it's a story where I don't know if you realize this and if you've ever faced a situation or a circumstance in your life where there was something you felt called to do, but everybody around you said it couldn't be done. Now that's different from when you felt you wanted to do something and everybody around you told you you shouldn't do it, right? We all got those stories, don't we? When we know we shouldn't do something, everybody says we shouldn't do it, but we're like, that's all right, I'm going to do it anyway. Not one of those stories. I'm talking about those stories when you have a dream or a passion or an idea for something and it's never been done before. And the people around you say, man, you can't do that. It's never been done before. What are you, crazy? And I was thinking about this and over the last few weeks and months, I had to take a bunch of trips up to New York to see my dad as he was sick before he passed away. And I found myself just re thinking about this, that I, that I was on 14 different airplanes in a five-week time frame. And I was thinking, and I'm like, man, like 120 years ago, Orville and Wilbur, right, were sitting there talking to some buddies and like, hey, I got an idea. I think we could get some sticks and some twine and mom's drapes, and we could make us the flying machine. And you know that sounded crazy. And people were like, what are you thinking? We were not meant to fly. If God wanted us to fly, he'd give us wings. And they're like, no, imagine a vehicle, a craft that would take you into the sky. How high? 20 feet. <laughs> How far? 47 yards. And I'm thinking about this as I'm flying in this airplane 100 plus years later, 14 of them over the short time, and I'm like, wow, what if they would have listened to everybody who said it couldn't be done? 
Now, maybe you and I, we're not the right brothers. We don't have that kind of great idea, right? Maybe we're not. But there are things that I believe that God places in the heart of people that if we just had enough faith to pursue it, God will take care of the rest. That there are moments where regardless of where we came from, regardless of our situation or our circumstance, God has plans that are beyond what we could ever imagine for our life. And that if we are faithful to step out in obedience, God will take care of the rest and do something amazing, miraculous, never been done before in the history of our family. And that's what we're going to look at today. We're going to look at a person who stood in the gap, because that's our series stand-ins today, who stood in the gap on behalf of God and his people at a critical time. And they found themselves in a position that no one would have ever believed. And in fact, as I explain it to you today and I lay it out to you today, you're going to be like, that's in the Bible? And I'm going to be like, yes, you all should read it. It's awesome. In fact, we're going to get to some parts where you're like, no way that's in the Bible. And I'm like, dude, it should be a Netflix series. And then some of you are going to be like, I should have taken my kids to children's ministry because that was gruesome. Straight up. Aren't you excited now? So beyond uh, any more buildup, let's dive in to Judges chapter 4. Now, Judges is a book in the Old Testament. The Bible's broken up into two parts. The Old Testament, which is God's story from creation to the raising up of the nation of Israel and to the becoming of the prophets who would declare the Messiah. And then the New Testament, which is the story of Jesus and his disciples and the beginnings of the church. And so today we're going to find ourselves in the book of Judges. It's early on in the Old Testament. And the story of the book of Judges, let me tell you a little bit about the nation of Israel. When the nation of Israel was following after God and they were doing right, they were blessed. But then they would get conceited, arrogant, prideful. They'd get lazy. They'd get sinful. And they'd turn away from God. And then when they turned away from God, their neighbors, the other countries around them, and tribes, oh, they get frisky. Because they realized that the nation of Israel, they had power when they were obedient to God, but when they were away from God, they were weak and vulnerable. They had power when they were obedient and fallen after God, but when they were disobedient and far from God, they were weak and vulnerable. And so they would rise up. And they would begin to invade them and conquer them. And then the people would cry out and they would repent. And they're like, oh my gosh, we totally messed this up. God, help us. And then God would raise up a judge, a leader, a mighty warrior, who would rally the people and the troops. They would fend off the invaders and they would get the people back on track with following the Lord. So we're going to look at a story today of one of these judges. And this story is really unique and powerful in Scripture because it's of a female judge. Her name was Deborah. Deborah. (laughs) Debbie. Right? It's the only female judge in all the nation of Israel. So if you guys have your Bibles, let's turn to Judges chapter 4, starting in verse 4. If you don't have a Bible or an app, the words are going to be on the screen behind me. There's a stack of free Bibles in the back of the room that's our gift to you today. And by the time we're done with the story, you're going to start reading the Bible on a regular basis. So in Judges chapter 4, starting at verse 4, it says this, Deborah was the wife of Lapidoth. Well, Deborah lucked out on the names right there. And she was a prophet who was judging Israel at the time. Now remember, I just explained to you what a judge was, because when you read this, you're like, well, there's Deborah, she's the wife of Lapidoth, she's a prophet, and she's judging Israel. Some of you are all thinking like, oh, like the Golden Girls? Oh my gosh, can't believe what she wore to church today. Look at her, woo, praising Jesus. And you see what she posted on Facebook? No, not that kind of judging, right? Not like the judgy judging. The judge that is a leader for the people to help them get back on track with God when they are off course and out of alignment with God. Judge there to help them when they're having disputes and quarrels amongst themselves and to pick the right path to follow. So Deborah, the wife of Lapidoth, was a prophet, so she was also 
a messenger who spoke to the people on behalf of God. So back in the Old Testament, God would raise up prophets to deliver his message. Today, we have the ability to have copies of his word and go directly to him in prayer. But God would raise up prophets. So we have Deborah, the wife of Lapidus. She was a prophet, and she was judging Israel at the time. In verse 5, it says, and she would sit under the palm of Deborah. So she would hang out under this one tree, and it became so famous that that's where you could find her. They named the tree after her. Whose tree is it? Oh, that's the palm of Deborah. Why? Because Deborah sits there. Deborah. And the Israelites would go to her for judgment. And she would sit there, right? And it was between this foreign weird name place and this other weird name place that I'm going to spare you because we've got a whole bunch of weird name places. And they would go there and she would judge. And it says, and one day she sent for Barak, the son of Abinoam, who lived in Kadesh in the land of Nephtali. Yeah, you know you're in the Old Testament when it sounds like that, right? And she said to him, this is the word of the Lord, the God of Israel commands you. She got a message from God for Barak. He says, this is what God wants for you. Call out 10,000 warriors from the tribe of Nephali and of Zebulon at Mount Tabor. And I will call out Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army. Now, Jabin was the leader of the Canaanites, and the Canaanites, not big fan of the Israelites. He says, and I will call out Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, along with his chariots and his warriors to the Kishon Valley, and there I will give you victory over him. So God speaks to Deborah. So what do we know about Deborah? Well, the first thing we know, it says that she was married. She was married. She was a prophet. And she's the only female judge in Israel's history. Man, can you imagine her growing up? Hey, Debbie, it's career day at school. What do you want to be? And she's like, I don't know. Faithful to God? Obedient to the Lord? See, because she didn't just end up in that position. She didn't just end up as a woman in a male-dominant society being a messenger of God and being a judge. She got there. Why? Because of God's blessing on her life as she was obedient to the Lord. As she was obedient and faithful to God, he entrusted her with more and more and more. Until one day she had the most powerful position in all the nation. And that God would use that position. See, it's a simple principle that greatness, it comes after consistent obedience. She, she didn't set out for that position because there's no way she could have, because nobody's ever done it before. There had been judges, but there had never been a female judge like she was dreaming a dream and living a life that nobody else could have ever imagined. But it came as the result of faithful obedience. That great position, it came after the consistent obedience. And when God trusted her, he blessed her with more. And so there she finds herself on this day that God wants to use her to help his people. And he gives her a message to call upon this man, Barak, and she calls him and she says, this is what God wants for you. He wants you to do this thing. And we pick up the story in verse 8. The Barak told her, I will go, but only if you go with me. I will go do this thing, but I have some conditions. Only if you go with me. In verse 9, she says, very well, she replied, I will go with you, but, always a but, but you will receive no honor in this venture, for the Lord's victory over Sisera will be at the hands of a woman. See, God had a plan, and he wanted to use Barak, but Barak was not confident enough, and he had some conditions, and as a result of this, God's message through Deborah was, well, now you're not going to get the blessing and the honor. 
it's going to go to somebody else. So Deborah went with Barak to Kadesh. And at Kadesh, Barak called together the tribes of Zebulon and Naphtali and 10,000 warriors, and they went up with him, and Deborah with him. And so they went there. And so here's the thing. We've got Barak, this powerful warrior, this respected leader, and he was chosen by God to do something. He was given this mission to accomplish. And Deborah was the messenger. And as Deborah lives this, I mean, she must have been a wonderful, powerful, amazing woman because her stature and such as that, he's like, you know what, though? If God has this, listen, you know, why don't you come with me? Because if you're there, then we're going we, we to win. And how many times have you and I found ourselves in a position wanting God to move, and we're like, you know, God, I really want to do this for you, but here's what I'm going to need first. God, it would be great if you could have somebody maybe older, smarter, more mature, if you could have somebody better witness to my family. God's like, yeah, but I called you. God, it would be great if somebody at work would kind of really step up and be the leader, you know, and would really help everybody to get on the same page. God's like, yeah, but I, I placed you there. God, it would be great if on my team there was really a good influence and an outspoken person, somebody who's not shy, and God's like, yeah, but I put you there. And Barack, he doesn't realize it, but in that moment where he's like, wait, God called me to do this? And then he says, yeah, but you know what I'm going to need? I'm going to need you, Deborah, to come with me. In that moment, he missed out on his blessing. And as I was studying, I was preparing for this, and we're doing a whole series on stand-ins, and I'm like, oh, man, we got to do Deborah. Deborah is awesome. This is a woman like no other. We got to talk about her. It's going to be amazing. And one of the glaring things that just kept jumping out of me is in Deborah's story is the heartbreak of Barak. It's the heartbreak. Because he doubted that he would be the one that God would use to do the victory. And as a result, you ready? He missed out on the honor and the blessing that God had in store for him. And Deborah said, well, now the victory the honor, the glory, it's going to go to somebody else. And we pick up the story, and this is the part where you should have checked your kids in the children's ministry. Are you ready for this? Chapter 4, verse 21. Listen to what it says. But when Sisera fell asleep from exhaustion, so what happens? Barak, he gets his army, the 10,000 dudes, and they go down and they face off against Jabin's commander, Sisera, and the army of the Canaanites, and they get whooped up on. And Sisera freaks out, and he runs away. And as he's running to find a place to hide, some girl, her name is Jael, and she says, hey, dude, come on over here and hide in my tent. And he's like, sweet. I could get away and hide in her tent. And so it says, as he fell asleep because he was tired, Jael quietly crept up to him with a hammer and a tent peg in her hand. Oh yeah, it's about to go down. <laughs> this little woman who nobody had ever heard of ever before has the commander of the enemy's king run and hide in her tent. And she's like, "Woo! we're going to Sizzla today. <laughs> and it says she crept up to him with the tent peg and the hammer. And then the rest of the verse. And then she drove the tent peg through his temple into the ground. And so he died. You think? <laughs> like she picked up a tent peg and he, she grabbed a hammer and went called bam. And it went boom and pinned his head to the ground. And he died. <laughs> and you're all sitting there saying, Oh, Pastor Paul, how are you going to make something spiritual out of this? Oh, you just wait. <laughs> but let's keep going. Verse 22. So when Barak came looking for Sisera, he's like, hey, anybody seen like the army's commander? He kind of looks like a dude with like, you know, stuff. Anybody seen him? Jail went out to meet him and she said, oh, oh yeah, come here. I'll show you the man you're looking for. I nailed him over here. Don't worry, he ain't going anywhere. He pinned to the ground. 
right? And says to Brock, he followed her into the tent and found Sisera lying there dead with a tent peg through his temple. Dude, this is in the Bible. If you guys don't read the Bible, you are missing out on some good stuff. Whew. Do that as your quiet time in the morning. That beats coffee. You'd be like, what did I just read? And it says, verse 23, so on that day, Israel saw God defeat Jabin, the Canaanite king, and from that time on, Israel, what, became stronger and stronger against King Jabin until they finally destroyed him. You see, the ultimate will of God was accomplished. He just used somebody else to do it. See, Barak was supposed to be the guy. Deborah gave him the message. She's the messenger. He said, this is what God has. And Barak was like, yeah, but you know what? I'm going to need you to help me. And she's like, okay, but you're not going to get the glory. Now some girl that no one ever heard of, her name's Jael, she's going to pop up out of nowhere, and she's going to tent peg this dude in the head. And you're going to miss out on the will and the blessing of everything that God had in store for you. See, when God calls us to do something, if we deviate from that plan, he's still going to do what he had in mind. He's just going to use somebody else. He, he's going to do what he had in mind. He's just going to find somebody else. What he wants from us is our complete and total obedience to follow him in faith. He has so much in store for us, but we're like, you know what, God, listen, I mean, that's a big dream. That's a scary dream. You know what? I'll do it, but. And God's like, don't worry about it. That's cool. I'm still going to accomplish my mission. I'm still going to do what I need to do. It's just that you now are going to miss out on the blessing and the reward. And Barack's probably like, yeah, but I, I, I did what you said. And God's like, you did some of what I said. And see, reward and blessing from God, it comes when we're obedient first. But not partial obedience, it's total obedience. And for some of us, that might be a struggle, because I bet right now God is just kind of hitting you with something where he's asking you to do something, and you're like, yeah, no, no, God, I'm going to do it mostly. Like, I'm going to do it all, like, like a lot of what you said, just not this last part. In fact, one of the areas that I find people struggle with a lot when it comes to being obedient to God is with their finances. It's with our finances. And God has a lot to say about money and possessions and stuff. And the first and most important thing that he says is it all belongs to him. And out of respect, honor, reverence, and obedience to him, we refer back to him the first fruits of what he's blessed us with. Right? To show our respect, our dependence, and our understanding that he is the giver of all blessing. And I remember I was in this group of pastors, and it was, it was years and years ago, and somebody came up to this pastor, and they were asking him this question, and I'll never forget this pastor's telling us the story. This person came up to him, and he said, Pastor, when it comes to tithing, now real quick, if you guys aren't familiar with tithing, tithing is this biblical principle of financial obedience where we return to God the first 10% of what we earn. And then we live off of the 90. And so the person came up to us and said, Pastor, when you tithe, do you tithe off of the pre-tax amount or what you take home? And the pastor thought for a second. And the guy's telling me the story. He's like, and so here's what I said. He says, well, I said to him, I said, well, do you want gross blessing or net blessing? <laughs> now, for some of you, you're not laughing because you don't understand the difference between gross and net. So let me explain that to you. Gross blessing means the salary, all the money you make before the government takes out taxes, and then net is what you actually got to bring home to spend. And so what the pastor was saying is like, well, when it comes to tithing, do you want God's gross blessing on everything, or you just want God's blessing on some of it? And I think that's kind of the principle here with Barack is God's like, I'm going to bless you with victory. I'm calling you to do something. Do you want gross blessing over all aspects, or do you want just some blessing? 
And I think not just finance, I think we do that with God in all things. Like, like do you want God's blessing in all your relationships or just some of your relationships? You want God's blessing in all of your marriage or just some of your marriage? You want God's blessing in all of your hobbies and extracurricular activities or just some of them? Well, the way to get God's blessing is to be all in and all for what God's standards and values are. And so here we have this idea that like, as I read the story of Deborah, and she was remarkable, I also see something that makes me sad because it's the story of Barak, a guy who missed out on God's blessing. So do you want all of the blessing for your life or you want some of what God has in store for you? See, because blessing always, blessing always comes after obedience. And that's Deborah's story. She had done what no other woman had ever done. She served the Lord. She rose to the most powerful position in the kingdom of Israel. And she was blessed. And you know what I love most about Deborah's story? Is when the scriptures give her resume, did you know the first thing they listed was that she was a wife? I mean, she was a prophet. She was a judge. Yeah, but her first thing that they listed, she was a wife. Man, I don't know about you fellas, but I don't, I don't think you really grasp sometimes, man, the greatest blessing God has ever given us men is a good wife. It's a good wife. And, and I am blessed, man. If you don't know my wife, Jordan, you are missing out. But hands off, because she's mine. So you, you can know her, but like, like she's my wife, and she is a blessing from God. And she's incredible, man. She owns her own business. She works hard. She's handy. She fixes things. She does great stuff. She makes a killer filet mignon. But man, she's my wife. And she is special, and she's amazing. And I love that, because even in the story of God, all these other great accomplishments, man, they came because of the consistent obedience with what God placed, and he just kept raising up that opportunity. That's beautiful. It's beautiful. But when we look at the sub-story of Barak, he was obedient, but just not all the way. And as a result, he lives in the shadows of Deborah's story. He lives in the shadow of J.L., a woman we'll never hear about again in Scripture. We could probably know so much more about him. Who knows what God had in store and what blessing it could have been. But because he's like, well, you know what? I'll do what God says, but here's my condition, God. Here's what I need to make me feel more confident to be obedient to what you're saying. And you may say, well, Pastor Paul, is it really that serious? I'm just telling you it is. That when God calls you and I to do things, if he wanted somebody else to do it, he'd have called somebody else. If he wanted you to do it on Tuesday, he'd have told you on Tuesday. If he told you today, it's because he wants obedience today. In fact, delayed obedience is just disobedience. You know, when... I had the privilege, and I talked about this a few weeks ago, of when God called me to start Cross Point Church. And, and I remember I was driving on 50, and, and I was praying. I was like, God, you got to reach these people. Man, there's so many people moving to Hernando. And God's like, well, Paul, if not you, then who? And if not now, then when? <clears throat> and I was, just, I was just blown away, and I'm like, okay, God, I'm all in. I quit my job. I gave up my salary, my retirement, medical insurance, whatever. And we started with 10 people in my living room. And none of us knew how to start a church. I mean, I've been to church. I worked at a church. How do you start one? I don't know. <clears throat> so we had 10 people. We had the Bible. And we just had what God said. And I remember we started. And I would go around to places asking, like, hey, can we, can we meet in your facility? Can we write your facility? We're starting a new church. And place after place after place, the answer was no, 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 no. And I'm like, dude, we'll pay you money. No, 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 no. Over and over and over again. So we just kept asking. We just kept praying. And we just kept going. And then one day we found a place. We started. We started in Central High School. Then we moved to Challenger. And we were there forever. <laughs> and then now we're here. 
And I remember somewhere along that way, though, when we were in Challenger, and I was just thinking, God, this is so incredible. Look what you've done. God, thanks for calling me. And then I remember God just kind of whispered, how do you know you're the first guy I asked? Maybe I called somebody else to start Crosspoint. But they just had conditions. See, I'm going to do what I'm going to do. And I'm just going to use those who say yes. And it wasn't a bad conversation. It just put it into perspective. I'm just really glad I said yes. Because I got a front row seat to amazing miracles and to life change. That has seen over 6,000 people confess Christ as Savior. Man. And all I did was just say, yes. Unconditional. Nothing that you need to do for me or do it my way, God. The answer is just yes. And I don't know what God is calling you to do in your life and in your faith. What if the answer didn't come with conditions anymore? What if the answers didn't come with, God, well, you know what? This part of my area or this part of my life or this part of my finances, finances, that's hands off, God. What if we were just all in and we just said, yes. What unbelievable, unimaginable thing could the king of glory do in us and through us for his will and for eternity? And then when I read this story about how Deborah stood in there and look at the position and the blessing that God gave her and how this one guy was like, yeah, I'll do what you want, God, but I need her. And she's like, but you're going to miss out. You're going to miss out on so much more. And she even warned him. She said, but, but if I go, God's going to give the blessing to somebody else. And he didn't even heed that. He's like, that's okay. I'd rather just have partial blessing instead of all the blessing. Man, I don't want you to miss out on that. I don't want you to miss out on this simple truth that as God delivered Sisera and the army into the hand of Israel, that the lesson of faith that God uses people to do his will in the manner that he sees fit, and that the prophecy he gave to Deborah was clear, and that God was faithful to fulfill it. And as his people, when we submit to his will, we know that our reward from him is based on our willingness to faithfully follow him all in, no conditions. And I know that's scary, though, because what we're doing is we're saying, yes, God, and I don't know what it looks like. I don't know the details. I don't even know the outcome, but I'm going to step out in faith. And be obedient. In fact, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, it says this exact truth. It says that faith shows the reality of what we hope for, and it is the evidence of things we cannot see. In other words, I'm going to take this step of obedience, not knowing what's in store for me, not knowing the outcome, not knowing the details. And when I take that step of obedience, the Bible calls that faith. But not faith in my ability, not faith in what I can do, but faith in God and what he can do. Because I believe I serve and follow a God who is greater than whatever I can see. And that he has proved himself faithful over and over and over again. And just like Deborah, I don't think she just found herself one day in that position. No, it was the consistent obedience in the small things that allowed God to trust her for in that moment to deliver this message for his people. And just like Barak, Barak was the guy chosen out of the entire nation. Why? Because he had shown himself faithful. He was a warrior. He was respected. He was a leader. He was a commander. And God called him and said, listen, I got a mission for you. And in that moment, though, regardless of God's faithfulness, mess, he doubted what God could do through him alone. And the reality is this, when you and I put our faith in God and we trust him wholeheartedly, man, it is blessing and reward from God that we can't even imagine. Tangible and intangible ways, and we get to see and be a part and get a front row seat to the miracles of heaven here on earth. 
And I don't want any of us to miss out on that today. And so as you take inventory right now and you look at your life, my question is this, what is your faith in? Who is your faith in? Because there is only one that is worthy of our faith, and it's Jesus. Is your faith in you and your abilities, your talent, your agenda, your bank account? Is your faith in what you bring to the table? Because I want you to know, at some time in life, what you bring isn't going to be enough for what you face. In fact, that's why some of you right now are having a crisis of faith, because what stands before you is bigger than what you can bring to bear. But when I, in faith, am standing there because God told me to, then what I bring to bear is the king and his kingdom come. And so while it may look daunting to me, it is doable to him. For all things are possible with God. And so who is your faith in? Is it in you? When you stand before God in eternity and he says, why should I let you into my kingdom? Are you going to say, well, I was a pretty good person. I tithed off of my net earnings. I was mostly obedient. Or are you going to say, no, God, I'm a sinner, but I was all in on your grace called Jesus. And where I was lacking, God, I confessed my need and you poured out from heaven grace in Jesus' name. Who is your faith in? What is your faith in? And today, I'm encouraging you, I'm challenging you, do not leave here until you put your faith in Jesus. And as we wrap up today with our next steps, this first one is the most important, to accept Jesus as Savior. Because it is the one decision that determines every decision from here on out. It is the one decision that echoes for eternity and impacts every moment from here on out to put your faith in Christ. And the Bible says to turn to faith in Jesus means to confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that he is Lord. To recognize and acknowledge him as the one who has done what I could not do for myself. So I want to ask you right now, bow your heads and close your eyes. Nobody moving around, no distractions. In the sincerity of this moment, if the Holy Spirit of God is calling you to salvation, He's calling you to surrender your life to him. Then right where you are, you pray with me this prayer of confession as I pray out loud. And surrender your life to Christ. And you put your faith once and for all in him. All in. No holds barred. Not holding back. No conditions. God, I'm all in for you. Pray with me now. Dear Jesus, here I am. And I surrender my life to you. All that I am, all that I was, all that I will ever be. I give you my life, my heart, my soul, my very breath in my lungs. I confess, I surrender to you. And I believe in my heart that you are Lord and that you rose again. You saved my soul. And upon this confession of faith, fill me now with the indwelling of your Holy Spirit to lead, guide, teach, and direct me all my life. And for your Holy Spirit to come in power to give me victory, understanding, and self-control as I faithfully and obediently follow you. I pray all of this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. And if you prayed and accepted Christ today, surrendering your life to him, let us know. Pull out that connect card that's in the seat back in front of you. Fill it out with your information. Check off that next step and drop it in one of the offering boxes on your way out. If you're watching online, click the link next to this broadcast. Let us come alongside you and help you on your faith journey. And our second next step, it says this, that I will trust and follow God's plan. Period. No questions, no conditions. Just, I will trust and follow God's plan. What is he saying to you? I believe as I've been speaking up here, the Holy Spirit of God has been speaking straight to you. 
There's a situation, there's a circumstance, there's an area of your life where you're holding back from God. There's a relationship that you're reluctant to give up or surrender. There's an addiction that you're reluctant to give up or surrender. There's a financial plague in your heart that you are reluctant to give up and surrender. And God's saying, listen, I want to pour out gross blessing on you, but you're only giving me net obedience. Give it to me. See if I am not the faithful God. In your hands, you're defeated, but in my hands, we can be victorious. Go all in. Why? Because blessing always comes after obedience. And in this story today, the tragedy, Barak missed out on all that could have been his. I mean, he was obedient to a point. He was faithful, but with conditions. May that not be our story and our testimony. May we be the people who are all in and say yes, unconditionally. And our third next step is if you've been coming to Crosspoint and you want to know more about this place and how to go from just attending on Sunday but being plugged in and connected to this church, to this family, then sign up for our discovery class this Wednesday. We'll have free child care. It's at 615. You can scan the QR code and sign up right there from your phone. It's an opportunity where I just share the heartbeat of this place. What's God up to? How did we get here? And how do we partner together to make a significant impact for such a time as this, in your family, in our community, and to the ends of the earth. Let's do something together. That's what we're going to talk about at our discovery class. And then lastly, to memorize Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Faith shows us the reality of what we hope for, and it is the evidence of things we cannot see yet. May God calls all of us to step out in faith. And I don't know all the details. I don't know the ending. All I know is this. If he said go, then I know he's going to meet me there. And he's going to walk along the path with me. And I'd rather walk with him into the unknown than stay in the known without him. So may we be a people of faith. Listen, it's been an honor and a privilege to share this message in our series called Stand-Ins. And if you're new here, I'd love to meet you after the service in our first time guest lounge. And I want to pray for you as we close out our time and the band dismisses us. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you, we praise you, we thank you for today. We thank you for this time and I pray, Lord God, your peace and your blessing over us. I pray that we would be faithful to that which we heard, that we would put into practice, that we would live out, and that, Father, we would be a people with no conditions, holding nothing back, but confidently and faithfully following and trusting you. For you alone are worthy of our praise and our obedience. May we be a people who you have found faithful with little and continue to bless with more as we steward all that you've entrusted us with. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you.